All right, well, welcome back to the second half of our session. Um, we've heard from three startups, each with their own uniqueness and, and commonalities as they've launched their journey using shared facilities. And these challenges often are observed by those running the, uh, the shared facilities. And so I wanna welcome our panelists who will help us think through some of the, uh, the, the questions on how to put together the most useful environments um, to help startups and, and ideas emerge from the academic environment. Um, as I introduce each panelist, we'll, we'll take a minute or two to hear their, a little bit about their facility and their unique environment. Um, and then we'll open it up for questions from the audience um, and the discussion. So um, as before, you can type your questions into the chat um, at any point in time and we'll pick it up from there. Um, and if any, the running over on the previous session is any indication because we had so much fun in this case, we'll probably be, be running until until we get kicked out, otherwise we'll be here until 10. Um, but anyways, I'm delighted to introduce uh, Sandrine Martin, Managing Director of the University of Michigan, University of Michigan's Lurie Nanofabrication Facility, or LNF. Um, Sandrine received her PhD from the U University of Paris 6 and joined the uh, Center for Display Technology and Manufacturing at the University of Michigan in 1996. She has been with NL L the LNF since 2004, first as technical manager of the NSF NNIN program, and then since 2015 as LNF's <laughs> managing director. And Sandrine. Thank you, Jörg. Um, and just to add a little bit to that, so the University of Michigan, the Larry Nanofabrication Facility uh, is part of the College of Engineering. We have about uh, 450 researchers who use the facility every year. Um, roughly two thirds of them are researchers from the University of Michigan, uh, but the remaining third uh, are people from outside of U of M. And so uh, we have many startup companies that are using the capabilities of the LNF, um, whether it's silicon processing or three, five semiconductors, MEMS, lots of different types of research project. And our objective is to try to support them as they are kind of growing from the startup phase to uh, becoming more established. Um, and so, you know, I'll, I'll stop here for, for the introduction. Uh, and I'm sure we'll have more discussions uh, in a few minutes. What, wonderful, thank you, yeah. Um, it's my pleasure to next introduce uh, Julia Abbasold, manager of the Micro Nanotechnology Center at the University of Louisville. Uh, Julia received her PhD in mechanical engineering from the University of Louisville in 2005. Um, her research focused on the development of a strain sensor in biocompatible housing, uh, in a biocompatible housing for telemetric strain monitoring. After the PhD, Julia worked as a research scientist on federally funded research since 2000 or and since 2012 has been managing the Micro Nanotechnology Center at the University of Louisville. Um, Julia. Thank you very much for the intro, Jorg. Jorg. Um, likewise, com comparable to University of Michigan, we also have a clean room facility and also uh, imaging and characterization facilities. Uh, but we are very much geared towards working with external entities. In fact, we have very much tried very hard to adopt a business mentality where we have very easy, easy open access capability to our facilities, training, um, ways that you can you know, reserve and, uh, equipment and, and, and get as much help as possible and so forth. We, uh, our, our makeup of our facility is roughly about half and half as of external clients but also with uh, internal researchers. And we have a, a big cross mix of folks who actually contact us to, to do services for them. We prefer people actually come into our facility and use our facility, <clears throat> pardon me, because uh, it helps uh, alleviate our resources. And, but as a result, the, if you were to look at the panoramic view of our clients and so forth, we have clients from all over the country uh, including right here in our own backyard and also from other academic institutions as well. All right, awesome. Um, yeah, thank you. And our, our third panelist, um, John uh, Jacoponi, is VP of Technology Strategy at NY Creates. Uh, uh, John is an industry veteran with more than 25 years of experience, including with AMD and Global Foundries and across Silicon Valley, Texas, and New York. Throughout his career, he has focused on advanced technology R&D, including R&D alliances and consortia. And for the past, why create um, managing programs with major industry partners and most recently 
focused on technology strategy, including federal initiatives such as the NSTC. Uh, John received his undergraduate degree from the University of Notre Dame and his PhD in electric engineering from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Uh, John. Yes, thank you, Eric, for that introduction. Uh, so, uh, as you said, I, I'm with uh, New York Creates. We are the uh, not for profit entity that runs the Albany Nanotech facility that you can see behind me. I'm not really way up high, that's a, that's a photo. Uh, my, my SUNY Poly colleague, uh, Nate Cady, who was a presenter in the prior session, talked a lot about uh, how he, as a user of that facility, uh, operates. So, I won't uh, duplicate any of uh, uh, repeat what he focused on. Our primary focus today is our sponsored programs, which is our focus on our large industry partners. Um, our that that we have a, a manufacturing USA Institute, which is aimed photonics. Um, we also support uh, businesses of any size, small, medium, and, and large, through wafer services uh, access to our facility. Uh, and ac academic uh, academic support. We we basically see two types of programs coming to our door, knocking on our door, and that's uh, at various stages of maturity. Those are number one, true hard tech, new materials, new structures, new devices that need access to capability, uh, new process flows, and and designs that need access to a common flow, whether it's an MPW. Uh, or 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 custom made custom made silicon. Um, what one thing we're very focused on is with these new federal initiatives, expanding the model to better support startups, small and medium enterprises. And it's it's been very helpful to listen to a lot of the discussion throughout today, and looking forward to this discussion now. Oh, wonderful. It's, it's a pleasure to having you all three here um, as, as managing directors of academic fabrication facilities and VP of technology strategy. Um, you obviously have a broad sense of the tools and processes that are enabling uh, tech translation, but perhaps we'll start off with a question about the challenges. Um, what, what are perhaps the challenges that you face in supporting young companies um, who are trying to translate you know, academic discoveries into viable technologies? Um, and we can go in any order, we'll just bounce back and forth, so. I vote Sandra can go first. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll jump in then. <laughs> I think um, as, as startups are, you know, going through the, the growth phase, one of their focus is, um, is optimizing their process, right? Making it more robust, starting to address technology issues, um, looking at ramping up volume uh, and, and yield and reliability. And uh, that means that on the, on the facilities side, uh, obviously we are providing access to the, the process, the infrastructure that they need first, the processing equipment that, uh, that they need, uh, the expertise that they need along the way. Um, but sometimes it's, it's managing those needs versus um, um, some maintaining some of the flexibility that we need for some of the other projects and, and, uh, and helping uh, the, those startup uh, researchers and, and entrepreneurs uh, go through those steps and you know, use the appropriate equipment that they need. Uh, I mean, they, they don't want to do one sample at a time. They need the ability to, to run multiple wafers or to run the same process over and over again. And uh, managing that while um, all the other researchers are also doing their work, uh, sometimes that's, that can be a, a, you know, prioritizing resources that are available at the facility. And that goes back to also what Julia was saying in, in making sure that, um, that we are using our resources as appropriately as possible. Um, I, I'll, I'll add to that as well. Sometimes startups are also in a pickle of a position where they may have angel investors or they may have types of investors that are saying, okay, exactly tell us when this product is gonna be ready to go to the next step. And when you're in, it, in, in particular, our facilities are mainly geared towards prototyping, okay, and finalizing a process. So when you're, like in our facility, <clears throat> or let me back up, 
in a manufacturing facility, you've already worked through your process. You've got usually dedicated tools. You don't change their settings. They don't wander very much. People are not putting weird materials in them, making things get all, uh, changing things and so forth. But in a prototyping facility, it's kind of like, it's open. We do try very hard to control things like contamination and performance of the tools, but it can vary a little bit. But when you also have uh, a project or a design that you're trying to work out the bugs and somebody is pressuring you saying, okay, and, and, you're, and you're tied to a fixed budget and so forth, and things don't go exactly right the very first time or the fifth or the sixth, eighth time, uh, it can be very frustrating. And sometimes the companies, the startup companies have a hard time um, sometimes they can't meet their budget objectives. Um, and sometimes they, they may run out of money or they may have to go and ask for additional monies. But the, the one thing that, that we always say to our clients is you can't schedule an invention. It will happen when the physics and chemistry are ready. So, John? Well, I'll just add a, a, a few more, more comments. Uh, Julie hit on one of the key terms. Uh, and, and that actually, it, for, for all of our facilities, uh, it might, might come down to, to, to money. Um, space is precious, capital tools, uh, capital expense is expensive. What we find is that startups, uh, academic ideas need the ability to change materials, have flexible space, have flexible tools uh, that any one entity, any one company can't afford to buy that. And, and that's why we're optimistic about the, the federal government providing some of a backstop so that the tools can exist that this month, this week, user one can use it, and then we can change it to something else, a uh, different material that's that's still compatible, but for, for a different user. Same thing for paying for the masks uh, or, the, or, the, or the wafer runs, uh, sharing that among more users uh, spread, spreads, the, spreads the cost. Mm -hmm. uh, one other thing I wanted to throw in there as well is that we also, we know that the startups, they're probably their most precious asset is their IP. So we also try to make a very conducive and welcoming environment that their IP remains protected as they're working through our facility, unless they approach us where they want to be interactive and contributory towards their design parameters and performance from there. But we, we try very hard to come up with your idea, then come to us, we'll help you run it through our facility. But if you want us to contribute to design, then that's when we have to get the university involved as far as IP. So I, I, I'd say that's also a, a concern of mine with the startups as well. So the IP remains with the startups unless you do the work for them or the thinking for them. Well, or or we we actually want them to come to our facility and run. You know, we want to train them and have them come into our facility and run run their product through. Now, logistically, that can be a problem, especially like if they're in uh, North Dakota or if they're in New Mexico or, or wherever from there, <clears throat> and they can't physically come here because. Other reasons why clients would come to us is they don't have the they don't have the capital asset to, to actually run the process. They don't want to disturb a production line. They don't want to um, they don't have the expertise and they want to rely upon us or they're under a time crunch. So we may do service work for them as well. In fact, actually, a lot of your users in, in as, as well as Sandrine's users and are companies and, and are they all local or do you deal with a lot of people? from out of state or across the country and how, how what is more, how is, are the challenges there in, in communicating with them? Cause they can't come into the fab and look at things when there are problems, I imagine. Sandra? Uh, <clears throat> Zoom is helpful, right? I think that has helped <laughs> in a sense. I think the, the past few years have helped facilitate all these discussions uh, with people who are not local. Uh, I think just as Julia, we also have a lot of users who are coming from, who are not from the Ann Arbor, the Southeast Michigan area. And, um, and for them, the flexibility is key. 
um, you know, the, the ideal solution is for them to have enough resources that they can actually come on site and use the equipment themselves and work with our engineers to this way they can handle the wafers, handle the designs and, and do everything. But it's not always possible. And sometimes it's lack of personnel in a startup. Sometimes it's distance. Um, but having um, those discussions, uh, a lot of you know, a lot, a lot of it happens before the work actually starts. Uh, whether it's someone who has an idea and how to translate that into into a fabrication facility or into this particular facility, even if they have done it somewhere else, if they want to translate it into um, what it would take at LNF, there is always some work that needs to happen. And from our end, the idea is to try to be as flexible as possible so that if they can come in, we'll support them that way. If they cannot come in and they just want to send wafers and we're going to have our engineers do it as, as a service work. Or sometimes they cannot come in, but they don't want to send the wafers and the design because of confidentiality and, and definitely um, concerns. Uh, then one thing that has grown over the past several years, are, um, at least in, in this area, are contractors. These are third party um, engineer scientists uh, whose business is whose business it is to actually provide fabrication services. And they would do the interface with the startup um, and provide advice and, and, you know, and get more involved on the IP side um, and help to get them uh, the, the fabrication process that they need. And then they are the ones that are working in the LNF. Or sometimes it goes through U of M faculty members that are also going to collaborate and, and do that interface. So the idea is that there is all these different paths and uh, every startup is different and what they needs, well, what the needs are, are different too. Right. Actually, a, qu a question from, from the audience was, um, uh, are your facilities engaged in formal programs of workforce development and, and what areas of the workforce do you focus on? Well, I'll, I'll start with that. Absolutely. Um, and the workforce development spans a wide, wide range. Uh, connected to the university system, um, bachelor's degrees, master's degrees, PhD students is a key STEM degrees is a key part of the pipe uh, of the pipeline. Uh, but there's a several other key aspects in the semiconductor industry, and that is the operators, technicians, the the people behind the scenes running the facilities. So the the, the local networks that I think each of us have with our community colleges, with our trades programs to build up that side of the workforce development is just, just as important. Um, the university, university programs, absolutely. Internships, um, those, are, those are key. Uh, the ability to uh, have hands-on students, hands-on tweaking tools, tweaking processes uh, uh, in a controlled manner so they're not uh, uh, disrupting the line it is important as well. I would add to that as well as we, we definitely have, uh, like for the city of Louisville, we definitely have representatives, not just for workforce development, but also for reaching out to um, businesses that are locally uh, residing here already and seeing if we have a good fit between our facility and those businesses. Uh, also, when the city of Louisville is courting in new businesses to come here and discussing, you know, TIFs and and locations and the, all those kinds of things they're also making them aware of what capabilities we have but then in turn they're also telling us like what kind of workforce that they need we have <clears throat> currently right now in in our in our area uh, a large ford battery plant that's going to be built here in the next few years and then just down the road up in uh, ohio is a 20 billion dollar intel semiconductor plant that's being built that plan alone wants 3,000 new engineers. So we, we are in the process of maneuvering ourselves to start, you know, start those discussions with those companies saying, what specifically do you need? And then we will start to develop curricula that will 
uh, cater to those needs so that we can start developing an educated workforce to go directly into those facilities. And I think that's that's really important because as part of obviously the startup are driven by the, the engineers, the scientists, the entrepreneurs, but as they are starting to, to grow and they need to scale up, they need to not invent a new process or a new technology, but they need to make it better, make it more robust. And, and you need to run wafers or run samples to do that. And um, that's where what we hear from a lot of the startups that, that work in the LNF is that they need... Um, they need more people. They need people that are that have some experience working in in a clean room and can run established processes and and you know tweak things and optimize, but not create it from scratch. Um, one thing that that we've done over the years and that has worked um, uh, is having um, students participate. It's either internships or program with the university where they are not doing research in the lab, but they are part of the staff team. So they help with uh, some of the standard tasks with maybe basic characterization of equipment and, and things like this. And that gives them experience working in a clean room that gives them some experience working on the tools. And we've had a number of them then kind of move on and get hired by some of the startups or young companies that are using the LNF and, and just help them in that growth process. Um, but that's something that, that, you know, definitely I could see uh, scaling more of it. In, in Southeast Michigan, we have KLA that recently um, set up their second headquarters here. And that's also uh, a place that is hiring a lot of engineers and people with that kind of experience. So yeah. there is and, a need. And actually expanding on, on that, perhaps on the workforce, in an academic setting, teaching classes on FAB and, and how to use the FAB and characterization and so on. On these kind of tools is very expensive um, because the tools are expensive um, and uh, you know labs are expensive is that shifting academic programs away from using the fabs for students and for student training <clears throat> do you worry about that um, one thing that i can tell you is that in in our facility what happens is that that there is a lab uh, that is subsidized partially by the department and then there's a lab fee that the students pay and what we're seeing is that more of that lab fee is being pushed more towards a student, um, which is which is kind of a shame, you know. I'm, you know, because budgets only go so far. But you know, when you start to increase those lab fees, you're going to see students not wanting to take those classes because they're so expensive. So I'm hoping we can balance that out. But yeah. Yeah, I mean, those classes, uh, there are classes in the, um, at, at the university here at U of M that are run in the, in the clean room. Uh, those are in electrical engineering classes, typically. And definitely, the cost is a, a challenge. And, you know, trying to optimize things, uh, there's, it's sub obviously subsidized, but still, it can, it can make the, the process expensive and, um, and kind of encouraging more students um, to to take the course and, and enroll is also an important element because like with as with many things, if you have more students, the, the cost can be lower. Mm -hmm. the, the, another aspect of students using facilities is not just the hands-on, but there's a, a, a large distributed network of students who could be working on design. And having their, the ability that their designs can run in any one of our facilities uh, um, is another key component. It, it's, it's part of the model of the fabulous industry where you may not actually be touching the silicon, but you've got the design idea and seeing that become real uh, is also part of the mm -hmm. education process. Mm -hmm. And I think that if if when students actually experience the, those lab sessions where they actually put on the bunny suit and gown up and go inside the lab and handle wafers, uh, maybe in, in their future career, they're not going to handle wafers with tweezers, etc. Uh, but it still gives them some understanding of how fabrication works in, in general. And even if later they are going into a more design role, um, I think that it's that experience of fabrication is actually going to be bene very beneficial for them. Yeah, 
Mm-hmm. Actually, at, at many universities, um, perhaps not so much at SUNY Albany, um, tools were, were a lot of tools were donated from industry um, in the 90s in the in the six to eight inch conversion. Um, and so the question is, you know, the donated tools, uh, can we train the workforce of the 21st century with the, the, the tools of the 1980s? That's a good question. Just the, just in lithography, it's, it's a whole different realm. Um, I mean, especially when you're trying to compare semiconductors and M's, it, it's, it's, it's not even <laughs> technology. <laughs> it's, it's, it's apples to oranges as far as the type of processes. And so, yeah, the, 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 the types of instruments that we have right now um, <clears throat> are, that, that is a challenge because I will tell you, uh, yes, the, the industrial donations are out there, but a lot of times there's sometimes there's a not a good fit when in taking industrial donations they're either too big they're meant to handle you know 25 wafers at a shot you know when we just want to process one at a time uh or the utilities the the quantities that you have to run through the the equipment are not suitable for a for a facility like ours so yeah that that's a direct uh that's a really good question like i said especially in the the lithography, the patterning area uh, in that aspect. And, and that's a challenge because, um, I mean, getting kind of a generation, the next generation, right? The more recent tools are uh, often, or tools that let's say are gonna handle 200 millimeter wafers or, or things like that. Uh, these are not easily sustainable for an academic facility. Uh, the the um, you know, the operating costs are going to be higher, the footprint is higher, the chemical usage is higher, uh, and, and it's not needed typically or not required by the local academic community. So, um, but yet it can be something where um, I know that we try to balance things between maybe some more manual tools, a single wafer at a time and things like that, and some tools that are going to provide a little more automation or, or volume, but we can't have two fabs uh, that are in, in the same space. And so for the startups, again, going looking at, you know, kind of the path and the growth, um, at some point, they, they need more. They are going to need things that are beyond what, what an academic facility can provide. And so that's, you know, having a path forward where, okay, you've grown out of this. Uh, you can run these kind of prototypes and, and small volumes. And now where do you go for the next step? Yeah, in fact, actually, from, from my perspective at, at MIT Nano, we've, we have um, equipment that is, is up to eight inch capable. It's not going to be automated equipment at the same time. You can run, you know, your three millimeter diamond piece all the way up to your eight inch wafer. Um, and the way sometimes I, I view this is, you know, the, the industry um, route is really this, this big highway, right? Where you have lots of fast cars, you can go uh, very efficiently. And, and in an academic setting, you're, you're exploring what's off-road to the left and the right from the highway. And, and sometimes you don't necessarily need a race car to do that. You, you, know, you can sometimes do just as well with, a, with an old truck. Um, a new truck is certainly also good. Um, but uh, that's sort of my, my analogy. Um, perhaps one, one final thought here. Um, what question that was, was asked from the audience, uh, what, what's missing in your facilities today? Money. <laughs> and time. <laughs> Yeah. It goes hand in hand, right? Yeah. Resources. I think that's often what it comes down to is that, um, you know, whether it's, it's space to install new tools, money to buy new tools that are going to provide more kind of a, a, a broader uh, portfolio to our yeah. users and, and resources, staff. The, these, mm-hmm. That's where a lot of the expertise is. And mm-hmm. that expertise is key for the startups to grow, to go through that increasing volume, making the process robust, uh, developing that. They need, uh, they need those interactions with our engineers and our scientists and, and getting their experience, whether it's to set up new tools or to improve the process. And, and that's what, you know, I wish we could double the size of our staff and, and we would provide a much better service to all our startups. Mm-hmm. 
I agree. Yeah, we the thing that uh, one of the big primary things that we run into is that we we have lots of capability. We have a large fleet of equipment, but it's aging and it needs to be replaced. And um, the 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 most of the models that the academic cleaners run on is is kind of a nonprofit, so to speak. But when you have to replace, so you are you are basically maintaining a budget and staff and resources to to keep your facility running. But you're not, you know, you're not allowed to make like a huge amount of money. You you are you are able to maintain some so that you can replace some things and so forth. But when you're looking at replacing several, you know, lots of large pieces of equipment that are multi millions of dollars. Most of us are not prepared to go on that route, you know, and, and we do get a lot of help from our institutions to go after those, but you can't, you know, you can't keep going back once every six months and say, okay, now I need a new LPCVD system. Now I need a new e-beam system. Now I need, you know, we need to increase this capability or we need to add this, you know, add this technology. And it's, it's so that, that, that's probably our, our biggest uh, issue right now is our aging equipment and replacement of that. Well, let me take a slightly different a angle at this. I, I, I agree with everything my, my colleague said there, um, but, but let me take a little bit different angle. And that is the, the trend in the industry over the last 20 years has been uh, consolidation and bring, bring things in house. And I, I think there's an opportunity going forward for uh, meeting of many different minds in uh, an organization uh, that, whether it's a consortium or whatever you want to, whatever you want to call it, uh, like the federal government is envisioning, where background ideas and expertise from many different sources come together and then can be. Uh, shared among ac academic users, le leveraged among academic users or startups, uh, while at the same time, those larger industry players also benefit um, by driving maybe pre-competitive uh, pre competitive R&D. And uh, that shared pre-competitive environment is, um, has, has, uh, has gotten smaller over the last decades as okay. stuff's come internal. Uh, what, one thing I will say, sorry, Jerk, uh, is that the within one one really good thing about the academic environment, though, is that we're we're tightly networked, and we have databases of awareness saying who's got what, and so like if if I have a tool and my tool goes down, then hey, I can call up Sandrine and say, Sandrine, run this six-inch wafer through your DRIE. And she'd be like, sure, no problem, you know, and do it for me and send me an invoice, you know, so, and, and it, it works out well. So it, it's, uh, we, we do have some, um, the, it, it's, we do have a nice network of shared capabilities. I think probably one of the problems we have is getting the word out of what we can do a little bit better though. Well, we're a little bit behind time, but thank you so much for, for stopping by here and, and giving us all these insights. Like I said, we probably could go until 10 o'clock. Um, we only have until five. So uh, thank you for coming and thank you for sharing your, your, your wisdoms. And um, I'm sure the audience appreciates it. And I certainly do. Uh, thank you so much.